Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, North Motor City Manmouth. Pleased to have my regular crew, Candy Ebeling. Hello, Scott. Glad to be here. Joe, J.B. Ellis. What's going on? How's everybody doing? We're doing all right. And last but not least, my partner in crime, George Eichhorn, had a good Motor City Madmouth show. Now we get, now we're on the show that we created another lifetime ago. The sports. Yeah, yeah. Sure did. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good evening. All right. Well, let me go over the topics here. We are going to pay tribute to 9/11, and obviously, it's a very tough day in American history. We're going to talk about the least and most expensive tickets in NFL. Week two, and we're going to talk about the Miami Dolphins and the Buffalo Bills tomorrow night. And we're going to talk, we'll also mention an Olympic note with the Canadian Olympic team. Eric Spolstra is a possible replacement for Steve Kerr. And J.B. Ellis will have his own topic. He gets to talk about Jalen Brunson or the next. Well, there's a pretty good player there. So with that said, let's take a moment of silence to honor what took place on 9-11. Thank you. That picture, Candy and I had an opportunity to go to that memorial when we were there. And, you know, it was unbelievable. I mean, you know, many years ago, I saw the Twin Towers when I was covering a Detroit Lions and New York Giants game over at the old Giants Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. So I had a cab driver drive me around. He's a really nice guy and took me some of these places. But with all due respect, you know, it's a day that will live in infamy. So I'm going to ask you, Candy, where were you on 9-11? You know, that there are a few dates in history that I think are iconic or uh, that you will remember for the rest of your life, like where you were when someone died. Like some people say, you know, like JFK. Um, I remember, ironically, I remember where I was when Elvis Presley died. Um, and then... 9-11. So 9-11, uh, I was driving to work when the first plane hit. Um, I was just walking into work when the second plane hit. Uh, I, at that time, worked at the VA Credit Union, which was inside the VA hospital, which is on um, federal VA property. We did go as the Pentagon was hit at that to point the VA went into a lockdown mode. So they, you know, locked down all the doors. There was only a um, couple doors you could go in and out of at that point. I'll never forget. Uh, one of my customers that worked in the hospital there came down and she was, she was kind of, and I hate to say this, but she was kind of a mess. Um, and I asked her what was wrong. And she's like, I can't get a hold of my sister and my sister works at the Pentagon. I don't know what, you know, where she is. I don't know if she's okay. And you would hear these stories, people coming in and talking about them. And life at the, at the VA changed from that point on. Like they closed down a lot of the entrances and um, going into the building, into the hospital for weeks, we had to go through them. Metal detectors, the first couple of days, they even searched, I'll never forget, they searched my lunch bag when I brought my lunch to work, but they searched everything because they were afraid they didn't know if there were more people out there going to do harm to anybody that worked for the government or that was in the military. They didn't know if there was more targets, you know. So it was surreal. Um, I would say most people at the time it almost like things stopped and we all were fixated on the TV and watching all of the events and everything that was happening. I mean, I remember the news people were, they were broadcasting the whole time, like the whole day. Like they, they hardly broke, they didn't go back to regular programming for the longest time. And I mean, it was a sad, sad day. And I can honestly say now I, I work for a bank that was inside the towers I have talked to people that were in the towers when this happened. Um, and I talked to one of my friends who her neighbor was one of the firemen that lost his life in 9-11. And it's just sad. It's just sad. And what I miss most 
and I hate to say this, I miss 912 because I miss the way the country came together and we acted together and we were all proud to be Americans. You know, we showed our support and our patriotism and we've lost that again. And that is unfortunate. And well, I think, all the lives, but yes. I think that could be attributed to the president. Was it George W. Bush? At the yeah. Time? George mm -hmm. W. Bush, who really brought a sense of calmness to us. So good story, Candy. What about you, George? Well, I was uh, an employee at IBM, IBM in Southfield. We had a nice, nice tower, you know, 13 floors, I think it was. Ironically, my car was in the shop. So I had a co-worker was picking me up at my house to take, I mean, I'm sorry, I took the car to the dealer and John was coming to pick me up then to take, to, take uh, him and I to work because we both worked there. So I, I, they wrote up the, they wrote up the order to have my car fixed. I went out, got into John's car. He had a music radio station on an FM station. He didn't have on an all talk station and they were playing music. And then all of a sudden they interrupted with this bulletin that, um, you know, the, the first tower had been hit and we're sitting at each other looking at each other and we're trying to drive to Southfield from Warren center line this area on the east side and and uh, i we just couldn't believe it i mean we left the station on and the news just getting worse and worse we only had like a 20 minute drive to get to get to southfield but we just shook our heads we couldn't believe well when we got into ibm of course everybody was upset and up in arms because we're talking about the tallest one of the tallest buildings in southfield you guys may remember at the corner of nine mile and in the in the Southfield Freeway IBM Tower, and so they put television sets on, and then I think it was about it might have been ten o'clock or ten fifteen or something. They sent a memo out to all the employees: if you do not feel comfortable, you do not feel like working today, you have the right to leave the office immediately. I stayed around uh, a little bit longer than that, unfortunately. Uh, to watch the, uh, you know, the sadness, uh, the, the second tower being hit and, uh, you know, the terrible fireball and, and, and just, it was just horrible. It was just horrible. But they put on a couple of TVs for us and uh, the, most people decided to just, you know, go home and be with their family. And I left about noon. Uh, but that was, yeah, that was where I was. I went to work for half a day, but my heart certainly wasn't in it uh, at all. Hey, Joe, on to you. So I was actually in New York City in Brooklyn. Wow. In, in Coney Island. It was primary day. We were up all night working on the campaign. Um, and my friend calls me because I was going to pick him up to go get breakfast. And he goes, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. And I, my question straight out was, was it one or two? If, it, what, if it's one, it's an accident. If it's two, I'll be there two minutes that was just one that's probably just an accident no big deal all right i'll see you in like five minutes hang up the phone i get a call two minutes later another plate hit the other tower so i raced to pick him up and i was fortunate because everybody i knew that was important to me was in my apartment that day so and i was lucky in that respect um all my friends and family were pretty much all there um, although some of that did vote for me before they headed to work at the World Trade Center, passed away that day. Wow. Um, you know, and it, it's weird. I don't know who it was. My father knew the, the man and my mother knew the man. But I, you know, for the life of me, I have no clue who he was. You know, and I heard the story uh, throughout that week. And I remember sitting there watching the TV and, you know, everything that's going on. Because when you prepare for months for an election and you're doing everything and you know all of a sudden this happens there, there's no playbook for this and what happens with the election means nothing you know so we're, we're sitting there and we're just having conversation and, you know one of the guys that's there uh his brother was on an express bus in manhattan he was very concerned which i understood you know we're trying to figure out what we're supposed to do next because we have no clue you know and 
you know, I'm not letting anyone leave at this point because I don't know what's happening and I'm not going to put anybody in harm's way. At least if they're with me, I know they're safe. You know, and we, we all just stayed for a while. And like Candy said, the, the only thing that was positive about the whole thing was, you know, the, pretty much the day after everybody was, we came together as one. I actually posted that on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn today. You know, as we remember the events of 9 11, it was horrible. It was disgusting. But at the same time, you know, the we all came together as just Americans. It didn't matter your skin color, your political race, your political uh, party, your race, your religion, anything. We just came together. Everybody was supportive of everybody. It was probably the nicest thing in the world. And it, it's a shame. You know, it, listen, I was not a fan of George George W. Bush. I didn't like the man. He did a great job in that particular situation of keeping the country together, staying calm, you know, and listen, that's what a leader is supposed to do. You you know, you, you can't, anybody can lead when things are good, you know, but when things are bad and catastrophic, right. how you lead says a lot about you. And, you know, I give him a lot of credit for, just his leadership skills. You know, everyone likes to make fun of George W. Bush about, you know, he's not the most intelligent, this, that, the other. But you know what? When it came down to where the chips were on the table, he just went out there, he led, he did what he had to do. And I have a lot of respect for the man for that. Whether I agree with his political policies or not, that that's irrelevant. Because you can always talk about that. But who he has is who he is as a person. You know, I, I was I was proud that he was president that day. All right. As far as I'm concerned, as I mentioned before, I lived in Arizona. But here's the thing. I was leaving my apartment to go to my attorney's office because at that time I was getting a divorce. So I'm driving down the freeway. No big deal. Go to my attorney's office. And he told me about it. I said, well, don't you watch the news? His name was Harry Kaywood, by the way. He, he worked out of Mesa. And I said, well, Harry, here's the thing. I was coming to see you, so if I didn't watch the news, it's because of you. I had an appointment with you. And he told me about what happened. It was unfortunate for sure. Now, as I speed the clock up a little with this, okay, the New York Yankees would proceed to go to the World Series. And who was the opponent? the Arizona Diamondbacks. So now we got a situation where everybody, I don't know if the Boston Red Sox were rooting for the Yankees, maybe they were, who knows, was rooting for the Yankees, and I'm actually a Diamondbacks guy. And that was in an unbelievable World Series, for those of you that remember it back in 2001. Uh, the Diamondbacks did win it, by the way, 4-3. to three. But, you know, it's like we felt in Arizona we were – on an island of our own. Everybody wants to root for the Yankees, and they had every reason. We have not only do we have the side star spangled banner, but you know, God bless America as well. And and now they still play that song at a lot of major, you know, at a lot of ball games. I don't know if they play it with other ones. So I it was unfortunate. You know, I've been there twice. I went with my cousin one time when they were actually rebuilding it. You can see, you know, the holes and a lot of the mess that took place. And, of course, Candy and I had an opportunity to go there about two years ago. But, Joe, I'm with you all the way, okay? George W. Bush went out there and stepped up at the most opportune time to do what he had to do. But here's a little interesting sidebar to all of that. I'm going to a Deerfield Beach Observer Christmas party. And you know what? They had a lot of different types of people wearing, you know, lookalikes. And there was a George W. Bush lookalike, and I did take a picture with the guy. <laughs> well, and I'm thinking to myself, hey, this isn't so bad. It may not be the real thing, but I'll take it because especially during that time, it was definitely a moment where he needed a great leader, and George W. Bush did a tremendous job. Sorry, Yankees, we didn't mean to bust your burst your bubble, but the Diamondbacks won their first ever World Series. So, and, and ironic, I, yeah. And ironically, two years later, the Miami Marlins beat the Yankees in 2003. <laughs> I had to get that Marlins plug in, but 
Don't feel too bad. The Yankees only have 27 World Series. We'll see when 28. Days. And if our if our audience hasn't seen it, go back and YouTube and look at George W. Bush when he threw out the honorary first pitch at that first game back at Yankee Stadium in that World Series that Scott just referred to. Because you got to absorb what was going on in that stadium and tears almost coming from his eye. And he threw a perfect pitch, a strike. The crowd went bananas. The umpires shook his hands. The managers, Joe Torre was there. Everybody, you got to look that up if you have not seen when Bush, like 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 you said, Joe. No matter what what your political persuasion was, it was just an historic event. It was a it was a uniting of this country, and and I'm and and I'm glad Scott you brought that up with the going ahead to the World Series time. Hey, George, you forgot. He also had a bulletproof vest on as he threw the pitch, which yeah, made it even more right, difficult. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, we have a little activity in the chat room. Blows 22 is on. What's going on? We're going on. All right. Blows asks, I like that hat. Is that new? No, that's actually been on my shelf. But for tonight, I wanted to pull the red, white, and blue out. That's why it's making its appearance on the big show. Looks like a mega hat with the red. Okay, if you say so. Pretty hard to argue with it. But, yeah, I have a lot of different color hats in tonight. It was time to go with the red, white, and blue. Good stuff, Blows. All right. Well, you know what? We got one more topic before we go to a station break, but no question that I feel we gave this topic a fair amount of time. It was great to hear the different stories from everybody as well. As well. All right. So let's talk about the least and most expensive NFL tickets in a week, too. The L.A. Chargers and Jim Harbaugh are going to the Carolina Panthers, and the least expensive ticket is 25 bucks. Not bad. It's going to it. All right. Now, how about the New Orleans Saints at the Dallas Cowboys? The most expensive ticket is $2,556. All right, Candy. <laughs> what game would you want to go to? $2,506 for a no, regular season? No, $2,556. You, you forgot $50. Uh, $2,556 for a regular season game for yeah. one ticket. Yeah. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. That is ridiculous to pay that kind of money. I don't care if you're sitting at the 50-yard line. That's too much money for a regular season game. My opinion, of course. Now, it, obviously that's at Cowboy Stadium. The problem with those kind of prices, and the NFL is doing this more and more because they're getting more and more expensive, is that you're going to see less and less kids, less and less families, and it's only going to be the rich that'll go. And then what's worse is now you're putting a lot of these on different streaming platforms. So again, you're trying to build this, this fan base, and yet families can't afford, oh, let me get Amazon Prime, and now let's get Peacock, and now let's get YouTube TV, and this, and that. And it's like, where is it going to end for the... How should I put the low, even the middle income and the low income people, how can they afford going to games, supporting this in a sport that they probably really like or watching all these on TV? I mean, granted, I get, I get your local market you'll get, but if you ever move out of your market for the team that you cover or like you're a fan of, you're going to, it's going to get expensive. That is why it's crazy. I cannot. I'm. I was shocked. Shocked when you told me that that price for a regular season ticket. Well, let's let's go to the chat room to blows twenty two. I guess he likes the hand. I agree. That's why I covered games from the couch. Okay. Well, don't feel too bad. You won't be alone there. It's getting out of control. No, it isn't getting out of control. It, it is out of control. All right. We'll turn it over to George Icorn. Well, yeah. I mean, Candy's got it right. I mean, it is getting out of control. It is out of control. You you said it right. I mean, we've got people that have a hard time putting food on the table, as the saying goes. And I know it's a cliche, but there are some very difficult times going on with with the economy and with the price of food and stuff like that. But to be able to afford the luxury, and it is a luxury, even if you're passionate, I know it's entertainment. People look at it at different ways, uh, you know, sports. A lot of people compare it to concerts, but... The fact of the matter is, is those prices are outrageous. You did bring up a good point, too, when you mm -hmm. mentioned about the different streaming services and how the NFL is 
has got this whole thing going now with uh, with these partners, streaming partners and Peacock and Amazon and all these places, you know, and, and, you, and you'd have to buy this or buy that to see your team. It is a very, very expensive sport now to follow for a lot of people, okay? But those price those prices are just going out of sight. But again, other entertainment value is 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 also going out of sight. I know that um, you know StubHub and places like that. I mean, you know the prices. People, I've got guys. Hey, listen, I've got friends that years ago did nothing but buy season tickets, and he says, "Oh, well, I sell every one of them. I mark them up, you know, hundred percent or whatever. Fine." You know, if you could, if you want to do something like that, and that's your way of making a living, and and he got that money back years ago. But I'm just saying that, yeah, every game is sold out. Detroit's a perfect situation too. Those prices are through the roof now because the Lions have season tickets and individual tickets. But I mean, the whole stadium is sold out for the whole season. So, yeah, it, it's getting out of out of sight, Scott. And there is still a dis- disparaging disparity between you know the average fan and and let's call them the the rich fan well george it doesn't hurt that they're winning either so well of course of course on, i know we haven't seen yeah. that verbatim in detroit for a while but let me tell you but the detroit fans are what they are they they're willing to pay for it they don't care all right off to joe go ahead listen i i happen to actually look to see how much it would be next week to see the bears play in indianapolis yeah. The cheapest ticket for that was two hundred and fifty dollars. Really, and that's in the six hundreds. A stadium that has a six hundred section. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sitting in the six hundred section to see a game that I can watch on TV. You know, football to me is the only sport that's better on TV. Every other sport to me, in person, is a million times better. But these prices are out of hand. Good for the. Good for the teams that can get the prices the resellers i'm not upset with them either you know if someone's willing to pay for your ticket sell them you know no reason that they should make their money it's all good the only thing i would say to that is you know if you really wanted to get tickets to go to an event you should have gotten them when they want to sell it's not their fault but the only thing that worries me is eventually and you see it starting to happen now teams that you know realize that these tickets are being sold for double and triple the price on these sites, they're going to start raising their prices because they know that they can get that. And that that's the only problem I have. Well, here's the deal with me. Unless I'm covering the game, I'm not going. Period. So it's 25 or 25, 15, 6 or whatever. It doesn't matter. If I'm not covering it, I'm not going. I'll be no, more than happy to go to an NFL game in a sports bar. And I don't mind going to our NFL events, Joe. Okay, when they're not games, right? You know, we pulled that th- thing before. I have zero problem with that. So, and you know what? I'm back in college. It doesn't matter. I cover the Miami Hurricanes and I'm Florida Atlantic University of Dallas and USF from time to time, and I'm more than happy to be there. So, it's okay. I've had my run in the NFL. If I get an opportunity to go to a game, I will. But there's no way I'd be buying any tickets. Don't have it. Been there, done that. But the one thing we haven't been and done yet is that thing called the station break, and we know the person that's going to deliver it, right, Andy? Sure. If you want to go to the tick, if you want to go to the NFL game tomorrow night, Bills versus Dolphins, cheapest ticket right now is eighty-two dollars a seat. So, in case you want to go, any of you South Florida people, you can buy a ticket, eighty-two dollars a piece. But the South Florida Tribune published a book last November called Lessons from the Microphone, Tuning into the Enduring Wisdom of Visionary Leaders. It is written by your host, Scott, the Motor City Madmouth Morgan Roth. And the forward is written by none other than George Icorn. It talks about Scott's 40 plus years in the business and how the business has changed over that course of that time. It also has a picture of young Scott with Muhammad Ali or a young Scott with Tommy Lasorda. Go get your book today. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kindle, Google, and Apple Books. You can also go to our website, www.southfloridatribune.com, where you can see everybody's writing around the clock here and my pictures. There is also a link to get his book. There is also a link to get merchandise like a South Florida Tribune hat or shirt or sweatshirt now that fall is starting to come to some parts of the country. Uh, if you lo- 
like to listen to podcasts, you can get ours wherever you get your podcast. Monday nights, we talk hockey on Fire Up Florida. Then we talk baseball. Tuesday nights, we talk football. Wednesday nights here on Sports Exchange, you just never know what Scott's got up his bag of tricks and we might be talking about. And Thursday nights, you never know what Candy's got up her bag of tricks on Fire Up on my show. But let's see. If you want to tweet, join us on Twitter. It's at Tribune South. Our email is southfloridatribune at gmail.com. If you want to advertise or sponsor a show, you can call Scott, 954-304-4941. And if you missed any of it, you can either rewind and listen to it again, or on the bottom, it's been scrolling. Back to you, Scott. Well done, Candy. And Jamie Ellis does an unbelievable job going out there and sharing our content. He really does a phenomenal job. You know, you see, you. Uh, he does. I mean, this guy here has made a lot of contacts on Twitter and everywhere he goes. I know that he does a marvelous job on LinkedIn as well. We both, that's one thing. We have a, J- JB and Ellis and I have a lot in common, but I'll tell you one thing, the thing that we've been able to do, and he has a good website of his own too, Sideline Sports as well, as w- which we'll get to in a little bit. So good job, Joe. Keep it up. We appreciate it. Plus, we also enjoy having you every Wednesday night here on the big show. All right, let's talk about a local event in South Florida. The game is in Miami. <clears throat> but in the last 12 games, the Buffalo Bills are 11-1 versus the Miami Dolphins. Miami's last win was on September 25th, 2022. They won it 21-19. So you know what? I'm going to start off with you, Joe. Who do you have tomorrow night? It's a tough one because, I mean, it's Josh Allen for the Bills and nobody else. He plays all 22 positions on offense and defense because the Bills' defense is atrocious, and he's the running back, and they got rid of all his receivers. So, you know, Miami, unfortunately, has injuries to the two running backs, so we're going to see if they play or not. Um, But overall, Miami's at home. Their offense is really good. The Bills' defense is pitiful, and I think Miami's defense is better, so I think Overall, I think Miami's at the a, a point of this game. But it's going to be a good game to watch because division games are always good. They know each other so well. George? I think it's going to be an excellent game, too. The over and under is 48.5, and the line is Miami minus 2.5. Very, very hard game to predict. Um, like you said, uh, Scott, the record is lopsided in favor of the Bills. But, you know... If they can't do anything this year, uh, and they probably won't, Buffalo, Josh Allen has just been, you know, he 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 just can't get it done. I mean, you know, it's a lot like Dak Prescott. You know, they thought they had the best quarterback in the league. All that being said, I know it's only the second game of this season, but I'm going to go with Miami too. I mean, they are at home, you know, a Thursday night game, game of the week kind of deal, and the fans will be obviously juiced up. Uh, the place will be rocking, and uh, I'm gonna, it'll be close. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say the Dolphins are gonna win this game. I really am. Uh, I'm not a big Josh Allen fan anymore. I used to be years ago, but they haven't proven anything to me in the last few years. Okay, Candy. I'm gonna be the third in the consensus. I'm gonna say Miami. Um, let's just hope there isn't any extra curriculars that happen before the game um since it is happening again in miami uh miami has i think too many weapons even if some of the running backs are injured because i know um most art is out um but they do have three kill and they have two or two has been i mean he threw for 338 yards last week I just think they have more weapons. I think their defense is coming to play. Yes, Buffalo has had their number for many years, but I think Miami has improved over the last couple of years, and I think the Bills are regressing a little bit. Okay, well, you know what? Well, I will go four for four, okay, <laughs> because that's what I'm going to do. But here's what I'm going to give you a name that I know that Buffalo will miss, especially tomorrow, a guy by the name of Stephon Diggs, who is with the Houston Texans. We all know that Tua has made significant improvement under the coaching of Mike McDaniel. 
Tyreek Hill. Who else do they have? I think Jalen Waddell, and they have a bunch of other running backs, you know. So Miami's passing game will more than make up for what the running game can't do probably tomorrow night. But Mike McDaniel has found a way to make Tua a better quarterback, and I think he uses positive reinforcement to do it. Unfortunately, Brian Flores wasn't able to to blush, blend with Tua, but that's old news. But Stefan Diggs not being with Buffalo, I think, is a big difference. You can't throw the football. You get rid of too many wide receivers. Where are you going to go? And you know what? I don't think it's going to be a close game. I have a feeling it's going to be at least a 10-point differential in the favor of the Miami Dolphins. But again, but, it's not going to be on regular TV unless you live in one of those markets. you got to go to Amazon Prime and get it. I'm not worried about it. we got Amazon Prime, but for the other people, I get that. Okay. Well, you know what? We're going to talk about an Olympic note. Very different one, I might add, but George and I can certainly relate to this one a little bit better. But Canada actually finished the Paris 2024 Olympics with nine gold medals, seven silver, 11 bronze medals, medals for a total of 27. Joe, I'm going to ask you first, okay, does that seem low for a country like Canada, which is so wide, and they have six, seven, eight substantial cities in there? I don't know. What do you think? Honestly, I have no idea when it comes to Olympic sports. I mean, obviously, the U.S. and China are so far ahead of everybody else. Um, Russia used to be, but with all the scandals and everything, I don't I don't even know if they're allowed to compete anymore. I, I'll be honest with you. I was out of this year's Olympics. It, okay. you know, it, it didn't do much to to make me want to watch. Um, I tuned to it sparingly. Um, you know, I I know the Canadians that are good at what they do always will try hard, but you know they're going up against countries that have more money that invest more into it. Um, you know, the U.S. Olympic uh, Federation is spends a lot of money and these athletes you know put a lot of time into it i don't know what if they're doing the same thing in canada i i'm not from there i don't go there enough to to know what their regimen is for olympic athletes how serious they take it but you know i can tell you that you know that whoever's there from canada always seems to put on a you know does their best and i'm guessing that it's about right okay fair enough george well, yeah, we're right across the river in Detroit from Canada, obviously Windsor, Ontario. Um, I, I was a bit shocked by it. I'll be honest with you. I'm not the greatest uh, tracker of all the Olympic history, but boy, oh boy, I've, I've, I've followed it pretty, pretty closely ever since I was lucky enough to go to the 1980 Lake Placid Games. And to see Canada with nine gold, seven silver and 11 bronze and only 27 medals, 27, almost a hundred medals behind the United States, which had 126 in Paris. And Joe's right. I mean, China's number two, great Britain. Oh my gosh. I, the Brits did a great job this year. They finished in third and France was fourth, but Canada, I mean, you know, way down the list, I was really, really surprised because number one, I know winter sports are bigger in Canada. Let's, you know, right. you know, probably than the summer ones, but still um, they don't have a lot of things going on there. Of course they love soccer and they love their hockey, but they're not as much. And, and the CFL, I understand uh, one NBA team only, but the fact of the matter is, is those athletes are trained and they're trained for all different sports. Canada is still one of the group of seven they call it nations where they have these summits every year, every year, these leaders. And I, I just found it really a, a, a sad, you know, that a great country like that was down that far. I was surprised, Scott. Okay. That's fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Can, Candy. I'm surprised. They had 27. Germany had 33. Italy had 40. Korea had 32. Great Britain had 64. Netherlands had 34. France had 64. Japan had 45. Some of those countries are way smaller than Canada is. Right. Um, but yes, I agree with George. Like the Canadians are north, so they are more prevalent in the winter games. Right. But 
to be behind the United States, which we had 126 and they only have 27. Yeah, I, I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm just going to say I'm surprised. I, I would have thought they would have had way more, but. Fair enough. Yeah, I think the number is a little bit low too, 27. I, I view Canada, if you're going to get at least 35 or 40, but it wasn't that way. And of course, George and yourself make an important point that they're probably better at the Winter Olympics. You know what though, Joe Ellis? I'm going to tell you this. The only things I actually watched during the Summer Olympics was the men's basketball team a couple of games near the end. Otherwise, I really didn't get too locked in. I had so many other things going as well. So, but yeah, the Winter Olympics for sure. All right. Well, one more Olympic topic, and then I got one for Joe Ellis. So get ready, Mr. Ellis. Okay. You're going to carry the lead on that. Now we're going to do parting shots as well tonight. Eric Spolster is viewed as the next head coach for Team USA if Steve Kerr retires. You know what, Candy? We're going to start off with you. Eric Spolster has done a good job here with the Miami Heat. Really has under Pat Riley. What do you think? You think Eric Spolstra is a good choice? I do. I think he's well liked. I think he does a really good team. He knows how to get the talent out of the players that he has on the court. Uh, he's done a he's done a good job down here for the Heat. He, like I said, he's popular. And when I and I think when you think of a coach for an Olympic sport like men's basketball for the USA you you want somebody that is well liked and that um can bring the talents together and the other thing he did is let's face it there was one time when somebody announced that they were bringing their talents to South Beach and there was the three of them and there was a threesome that were all really good players I'm not going to say elite I mean some you know, obviously LeBron came down here, but he also had to learn how to help them with their different personalities play as a team together. And I think especially when you go to Olympic like the USA, you're going to get a number of different players from a number of different teams, the top talent, and you've got to find a way to get them to work together as a team for the for the goal of the good of the team. And I think he's a candidate that can do that. George. Yeah, I, I, I think it would be a very good move. He's six, he's 53 years old now, you know, two time NBA champion, two time all-star game coach. He's worked with a lot of the guys and, 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 and done a great job down in Miami. Of course uh, he won a title as the assistant too. Um, but I think it's a natural progression for somebody like him. I mean, we've seen, Guys, we've seen some great coaches, you know, Chuck Daly and, and that wonderful dream team that he coached. And, you know, Steve Kerr has done a tremendous job. Mike, Mike Hay has done a great job when they've asked him, uh, you know, in the Olympics. And I think Spoltz would really, really not only deserves it, but I think he is a kind of guy that is got a lot of respect of players on all teams, not just his own. And it, it is a very, very um, serious decision, you know, when they select this coach. And I just remember the late Chuck Daly and, and how much that just jettisoned his career. It just kind of put a nice bow on it. Obviously, he won with the Detroit Pistons the titles. But um, I think Eric deserves it, number one. And, 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 and he's, he's the right guy for something like this, I have to say. I agree. What about you, Joe? So he started out as a videographer for um, the Heat. He worked his way up to being the head coach through dedication and hard work. He's won multiple championships, coached the biggest personalities in the NBA, and is still at the top level. So, you know, there's no question about is he qualified. Now, hopefully John Shearer is not listening right now because he's a Miami fan. Spolstra is one of the best coaches of the NBA, hands down. Anyone who doesn't think that, doesn't follow basketball, doesn't understand basketball, is he the best? No. But he's top three to top five easy. Well, I'll tell you what. You're right, Joe. He's won multiple titles here. But if he gets it, I don't think it's a one-time deal. 
I think Eric Spolstra is the type of guy that can coach in multiple Olympics because he's that young compared to what you have out there. So I think there's only one choice. It is Eric Spolstra, not only because of the job that he's done with Miami, but he sat on the bench behind Steve Kerr and other people to watch how the process is already done. So I could see him coaching in two or three Olympics. I really, truly can see him. He's a heck of a coach. I think he's underrated. Uh, how can I say he's underrated? Well, when you could sell it, uh, some of the other big names out there, he might. But I'll tell you one thing. I hope he gets it, and I hope he stays with it for a while. I really, truly do. So I guess we all agree on that. Well, guess what? This is the part of the show where J.B. Ellis has his own topic. Jalen Brunson is going to be is named the 36th captain in New York Knicks history. How do you like the move? Listen, he was their MVP last year. They needed him, you know, when it, all the chips were down. They worked their way to a number two seed um, in the East, which was phenomenal. They were, before the year, nobody thought of the Knicks as a threat. Um, obviously, they lost to the Pacers in the, the playoffs, which a lot of it had to do with injuries. And the Pacers played really good. They're a, they're a good young team, the Pacers. Um, but, you know, they outplayed the Knicks and ended up beating them in the series. Um, Brunson, you know, took over the leadership role. He was on the court. He was scoring. Um, and he just he became the leader of the team. So I, I have no issues with him becoming the captain. I think he's going to do a good job. Uh, you know, they have a, a good core of guys. A lot of them have villain overties, which is very strange. Brunson does as well. Um, but, you know, it's like Philadelphia moved to New York City and they became the Knicks. And, you know. <laughs> Julius Randle's out there in left field because he didn't go to Villanova, but it's all right. They still love him. Fair enough. Well, now let's face reality. Tom Thibodeau and him worked well, and Jalen's earning their stripes over there. And I'll tell you one thing. I'll go a step further, Joe. I think Jalen Brunson could play in any era of basketball. I love his heart. I really do. And not only that, he took a little bit less money off the what he could have gotten it be unselfish to try to bring more players. I, I know this is your topic, but I just thought I'd implement that as well. So with that said, let's go to parting shots. Joe, since you had this topic, you can lead off. So I'm going to go with the Cubs because we did do a Cub financial tonight. There was a lot of things going on. Okay. All right. So as of August, actually no, September, I think, 3rd, the Cubs had 23 blown saves. Right now, they see themselves four games out of the wild card. Um, I don't know how many games behind Milwaukee they are, but if you cut those in half, they'd probably be in first place or right up there with the Brewers. Um, you know, this is a team that has a lot of good young talent. They're fun to watch. Last night, uh, Peter Armstrong robbed uh, somebody of a home run in the ninth inning. I want to say it was Max Muncy, but you know, West Coast games are so late. Uh, you know, who has the luxury of staying up that late to watch them? Um, pretty sure it was Max Muncy, though. Bellinger has been unreal for the the Cubs. They're they hit more timely than they did earlier in the year. A couple of bad losses to the Pirates last week really put the put them behind the eight ball coming into the wild card race. They're they're battling two teams, the Braves and the Mets, who are neck and neck right now. Mets won a great uh, come from behind game, one uh, two to one today. They were getting no hit until the ninth inning. And Lindor had Lindor a game tying home run, and the Mets ended up winning, which is not good for the Cubs because it's another game that you know they, they could have picked up. Um, but the Cubs schedule gets a lot easier from here. I think they have three against the Phillies, and then that's that's it against good teams. So. They'll have an opportunity to win a lot of games if they can beat who they're supposed to beat. And hopefully the Braves and Mets have to play each other. they got to play the Phillies as well. The teams out west, uh, the Padres and the Diamondbacks, have to play each other. they got to play the Dodgers as well. So hopefully they can all beat each other up and the Cubs can just do what they're supposed to do and win a bunch of games because they're playing less teams, uh, teams that they're better than. And maybe they have a shot at least to make it close. I don't know if they'll make it because having to overcome two teams is not an easy thing. But at least make it interesting as we get closer to the end of the season. 
Well, they make it interesting. We'll put them on as a topic here. How does that sound, Joe? So with that said, George, give me your part. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, can I just add just a tad bit? Because Joe happened to put my Milwaukee Brewers in there. And I just have to say, at this point, Milwaukee is eight and a half games above the – I can't normally say that, Joe, because, I mean, the Brewers are having a good season. But I will tell you this. You are right. The Cubs have a much easier end of the season, and the Brewers have a much tougher end of the season. So they – the Brewers are playing some of the tough um, – they're playing the Giants. The, they're at the Diamondbacks. They have the Phillies. And then they have another four-game series against the Diamondbacks again and the Pirates and the Mets. So we do not have an easy end of the season here. But I have to – sorry, i got to shut out my Brewers. I mean, sorry. <laughs> well, team. you know what? Cub fans have to root for the Brewers because everybody that's ahead of the Cubs – the Brewers are playing, so we need you guys. You got to do what you got to do now. There we go. <laughs> Not too often you hear that. Cubs fans right? for the Brewers. Okay, well, now we have a little interesting thing between J.B. Ellis and Candy Emily. <laughs> Day two, we might have a few more of them before this season's over with. <laughs> and don't worry, Candy has her own parting shot, but I guarantee you, Joe, won't be anywhere close to what yours is. All right, but before we do that, we'll go with the George Icorn in the middle of this conversation. Oh, well, I got to piggyback on that. You kidding me? We're talking about, you remember the old saying, I want to play meaningful games? The Detroit Red Wings said that. They wanted to play meaningful hockey games in March and April. Look what happened. They did. The Detroit Tigers, who everybody gave up for dead, including this guy. Here we are on September the 11th. And they're 75 and 71. They won again tonight over Colorado. They are three games behind the losing Minnesota Twins. Well, they've won two in a row, though, the Twins. But they've gone into a tailspin. Kansas City has, uh, you know, uh, the, the first uh, – Baltimore obviously has the number one seed in the wild card race in the American League. Kansas City second right now. Minnesota is two games out, and the, uh, the Tigers are three – Three further back, they're five games out. But the Tigers are playing some great ball right now. They're getting good pitching. They're getting timely hitting. These kids that they've promoted from from uh, Toledo and and guys that started the season with them, or you know, they had to send back Parker Meadows. They had to send down Spencer Torkelson to you know for months. The months they had to go back to uh, go back to basics, if you will, down at AAA. But now uh, they're healthy. Uh, Green is hitting the ball. Kerry Carpenter's hitting the ball. Scrooble is is odds-on favorite for the Cy Young. I mean, the Tigers have come from nowhere and now ha are contenders for that wild card spot. And you talk about schedule. They've got some tough games, too. They've got a lot of games with Baltimore coming up, a lot of games with Kansas City. But what they've got it done and they're doing right now is take care of business with Colorado. And they got the White Sox, too. They're going to have to sweep that series as well. So meaningful baseball is back in Detroit. I didn't think I'd say it, but I'm very happy. Yeah, sure. All right. Quick question for you. Though. Sorry to interrupt, Scott. That's all right. You know, um, with the new schedules, the way it is, we're playing every team and the White Sox being so horrible. Isn't it weird that you got the Guardians, Detroit, and Minnesota all involved in the playoff race and the White Sox already are going to break the – the worst record ever in baseball. Yeah. Well, don't I forget mean, the Royals. Yeah, yeah. They have yeah. four teams that are, yeah. It's it is unusual. Wild. It is unusual for that division. That division has not been known to have the greatest teams, obviously. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, everybody's feasting on the White Sox. I mean. And, you don't, I don't want to realize today, I was looking at an article for the preview of the White Sox game today. You know, Cleveland lost to them five times this year. So. Yeah. Imagine what Cleveland's record would be if they lost to him once or or twice. I mean, crazy. Oh, and the Tigers idea. play him yet this year. The last se game, last season, the last games of the season, the Tigers are playing them. Yeah. Well, I didn't know Cleveland lost to the White Sox five times. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, no way. That's wild. The first place team <laughs> losing to a team that has thirty three wins five times. Wow. That's wow. Unbelievable. Good stat, Joe. Yeah. And we think Candy's coming up with a crack chat, but you just pulled one out of your pocket. That's pretty unbelievable. So, But you know what, Joe? I'm going to top you when I get to mine. Okay. 
Uh oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Candy. So I'm going way different than all of you guys. Kudos to my alma mater. My alma mater is University of Wisconsin Whitewater. They had seven current or former members of the University of Wisconsin Whitewater's men and women's wheelchair basketball programs won gold medals at the Paris 2024 Paralympics. They defeated Great Britain 73 to 69 in the championship game, solidifying an undefeated run through the tournament, clinching the team's third consecutive Paralympic title. They've had such a stretch of great, I'll have to say that they have such a great program for wheelchair, for men and women's wheelchair that they have done an unbelievable program. I'm so happy that they won gold again at the Paralympic Games. Kudos to them. Good job. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going back to college football. You know why I'm going back to college football? Because people in northern Illinois should be very, very happy at the moment. Because they ended up walking into South Bend and beat the Notre Dame Fighting Irish by a score of 16 to 14. But you know what's even bigger than that score? How about the payout of $1.4 million that they ended up getting to beat Notre Dame? Now, we talked about this on Inside the Pigskin a couple of days ago. If you're involved with college, you can get that $1.4 million to help fund your athletic program. You're doing some really good work. Guess what? Okay, not only did Northern Illinois do some really good work, they did it against the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. That's, to me, unbelievable. And congratulations to Northern Illinois. But I'm not done yet. Okay, recently, Montana State walked into New Mexico to defeat the Lobos. They got $360,000. What's interesting about Montana State is they're an FCS school. So don't sell those teams in Miami, or rather Montana, short because they're pretty good teams. And the big sky always makes it present felt out in with college basketball with March Madness. So, you know, obviously New Mexico doesn't have the bankroll that Notre Dame does, but Montana State can at least say they ended up being an FBS team. But I'm still going to rest on my laurels that. This just goes to show you that on every given Saturday, as well as Sunday, you know, if you're looking past somebody, you're taking a game for granted, don't do it. And I'll give you 1.4 million reasons why. So congratulations to Northern Illinois. And I have a feeling that Notre Dame will be eating crow over this and they can only hope to get in the college football playoff. But this did not help their cause at all. So. Can I, Scott, add to that? Sure. In, in week one alone, more than $35 million is being shelled out across at least 55 games with monetary guarantee contracts. Those payments range from as little as 300000 that Middle Tennessee is paying Texas or Tennessee Tech to the $1.9 million check that Alabama is writing to Western Kentucky. Very good. Thanks for adding, Kenny. Great stuff. Goes to show you that these first few weeks of the season mean an awful lot to schools that obviously are willing to take a beating. I work with a guy, Howard Schnellenberger, who took a lot of those beatings. But you know what? He built the FAU program from scratch, and now they have an on-campus stadium. So I can remember being a part of some of those games. And when FAU defeated Minnesota at Hard Rock Stadium, we were all rejoicing there because it was against a Big Ten school, and it was a pretty interesting game. So... But that's that. This does complete this edition of the Sports Exchange. But we have a little business to take care of. And we're going to lead off with Joe Ellis. Tell everybody now how they can get you. Hold it, Joe. So JB underscore the program on X, sidelinesportsnet.com. Again, sidelinesportsnet.com. The website Candy Built. We all write on. Candy's got some pictures of the rest of the people from Sideline are on there. Sideline Sports every Tuesday, 8.30 p.m. And here every week. And, of course, George and I right on there as well so it's pretty good stuff so but that said okay we'll go to george eichhorn go ahead george. all right yes yeah, scott's had a good book out there he's got a good book and you can pick his up and pick up mine mine is in the corners right over my shoulder here 
Thank you very much, Candy, for showing a picture of it. The Detroit Sports Broadcasters on the air. You'll see a link to that book and how to purchase it from Amazon at the end of my column. I write for the South Florida Tribune under the Motor City Tribune banner. Contribute to JB Ellis's website as well. And we're, uh, you know, we're, we're just having a lot of fun here, you know. Uh, 108 stitches on monday i have fun with that show as well as the uh, uh fire up florida and uh it's just been great being with you guys tonight follow me at gicorn at yahoo.com and on twitter at san g sports 99 and also on uh yahoo and wherever else you can find me but great to be part of this great show and you guys are great to work with enjoy the show tonight on a somber day though yeah, no question about it. And George Eichhorn is now my permanent co-host on the Motor City Mad Mouth Show, which is up here on No Filter as well. So I'm looking up there, and tell me, well, there's the old, there's a logo for the Motor City Mad Mouth Show, right, Candy? So there you go. Yes. So George Eichhorn is my permanent co-host there. With that said, Candy, Thank take you. us home. Take us home. So the other writer on this panel, the host, Scott Motor City Madmouth Morganroth, wrote a book. It is called Lessons from the Microphone. See, George has got it. I know JB has a copy. He's just not holding it up. Scott's got a copy. I've got a copy. There it is. Tuning into the Enduring Wisdom of Visionary Leaders. It is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google, no, um, Apple, and Kindle. Get your copy today. It's a great read. Scott has Scott obviously likes to talk. Because look at he's the host of this show and how many other shows. He tells some great stories. Go get the book. Read the stories. There's even there, it's the one time I'll say there's fewer pictures than there are stories. So go get the book. Read it. You can find a link to it on our website, www.southfloridatribune.com. There is also a link to our merchandising store where you can get all kinds of merchandise. On our website, also, all three of these fine gentlemen write and have submitted stories and are on our website. I take pictures to just, you know, I tell stories through a camera. They tell it through their pen. Go read it. Go read their stories. Enjoy my pictures. If you like to listen to podcasts, you can get our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts monday nights fire up florida we talk hockey then we talk baseball on 108 such as baseball talk tuesday nights we talk football on inside the pigskin we also have a former nfl player and a former coach on inside the pigskin go check out that previously tonight preceding this episode of sports exchange on nofilter.net Scott and George did the Motor City Mad Mall show. Go check it out. And then Thursday nights, I host Fire Up, where you never know what we're going to be talking about. Um, you just never know. We talk about all kinds of different things. And there's actually is an there is a segment that set that on that show. Did you know? So to find out a trivia question or an answer to a trivia question. Come check us out tomorrow night. Find out what we're talking about. If you want to advertise, call Scott, 954-304-4941. Again, go get the book. Go to our website. If you see that red subscribe button, hit it, like us, share it with all of your friends and family. We'd love to get this content out to everybody we can, that especially people that would enjoy it. And again, check out JV's website too, sidelinesportsnet.com. Back to you, Scott. Thank you, Candy. The one segment I like on that show is My Town. That's the one that you originally created. Joe, one quick question for you. What were what was the one thing you picked up out of my book that you were able to process? I, I think the relationship piece of everything. Okay. That's really the key to the whole business. Right. I mean, yeah. look at how long you know George. How yeah. long George is <laughs> stuck with you. <laughs> no, I was kind of wait. I was kind of waiting for you to say that. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That's okay. Uh, he stuck with me, and I'm stuck with him. That's just how yeah. it Hey, but you know what, Ellis? I'm stuck with you now too. So don't feel too bad. <laughs> right. And, and, and of course, I'm stuck with Candy. That's okay. We're all stuck with each other, and we're yeah. definitely stuck with each other every Wednesday night after around nine o'clock Eastern time. So with that said, this does once again conclude this edition of the 
Lord's Exchange, and once again, I want to pay our respects to all those individuals that passed away on 9-11. We're thinking about you in our minds and our hearts, and can't bring you back, but you know what? We can think about you, and we always do. I think about them 365, 366 days a year. So God bless those people. So with that said, that does it. We'll see you next Wednesday night. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night.